Hello, I'm uh, really. Ich lasse auch parallel äh, YouTube laufen, ne, den Kanal, falls, ich, falls da was bei euch passiert, dass ich mithören kann. Es wird dann hier sozusagen ins Mikro für die Kollegen, die hier sind, gesprochen. Und Karl hört uns aber auch weiterhin gut. Karl hört uns gut. Danke dir, Karl. Ja. Das kann parallel äh, YouTube laufen, ne, den Kanal, falls, ich, falls da was bei euch passiert, dass ich mich lernen kann. Recording in progress.
Actually, I also don't understand why I like it so much. As close as possible. <laughs> nah. Okay, welcome everyone to this uh, event by Borderline Europe with the name Deten Detention Camps on the Greek Islands, a new era in the EU migration policy, question mark. Um, my name is Lisa Westhäuser, I will guide you through the evening and before we start uh, properly, just the wish uh, it would be nice if you wore masks, but yeah, obviously, however you prefer. And gibt es jemanden, der deutsche Übersetzung braucht, es wird auf Englisch stattfinden? Die Person kann einfach unauffällig zu der Anmeldung gehen und sich dort so ein Empfangsgerät holen und dann könnt ihr das so übersetzt bekommen. Ja, ich glaube, die ÜbersetzerInnen freuen sich auch dann. Sie sind schon ganz aufgeregt. So Moria burned down in September 2020. I think some of you can remember very well this new people living in this overcrowded camp on Lesbos described Moria as the hell of Moria. And really nobody, neither the people on the move, neither the, nor the activists on the Greek islands alike could imagine that actually something maybe worse was going to follow. But that's what a lot of people feel right now. After the fire, the EU Commission, together with the Greek government, started planning and constructing new closed camps on the islands. Officially, these camps are called close controlled access centers, and they are planned at the Greek islands of Lesbos, Samos, Kos, Kios, and Leros. And Samos, Kos, and Leros are already inaugurated and in use. So what do these new camps look like? I think we all have the images of these like jungle-like, this is what they were described, type of camps like Moria in our head, but what do these new camps look like? Before we discuss this on the panel, we want to start um, with Ruveli Haj Salim, who will give us a first impression. He is from Syria and has been stuck on Samos for more than two years, and we will hear him in a documentary by Ahmad Ibrahim. Hello, I'm Ruel uh, Haji Salim. I'm from Syria. I was in Syria, but I came to Europe to found a safe life for me, but I didn't found it here in Greece because I am here in Greece two years ago and now they will uh, move from the, this camp to a new camp. And really I feel it's, they will put me in prison. It's not just my feeling. A lot of people, they feel like this. And a lot of people, they don't know what what will do, what they will do. Because after two years, they will put him in prison. Why? Why they will put us in, in the prison? I'm a person, I have a feeling, I have a heart, I have a future. I didn't do anything for my future. I 
and okay if you don't like be in your country in here in Greece why you keep me here for long time after that you uh, you put me in prison I don't like to continue my life in prison if you don't like be in your country send me to my country I need to be dead in my country not in prison here in Greece please you have to understand me it's, I have a feeling it's not it's not nice life here and they said ah you have uh, you are not in safe life here in this camp okay now do you remember not safe for me after two years you will put me in prison why why just I need to let you know because I don't I don't know what I will do there in, in the prison a lot of people they said it's not prison it's open camp it's not closed camp okay but you know it's how much how much far from the center city it's two hours for walk two hours and I can't come if I need something from the center city I need to two hours for walking why just I need to tell you that, that. and thank you Yeah, so um, Ruveli Hatch Salim is talking about his fear of going to prison and this was before he was moved to the camp and actually this description of the new camps as the prison is what keep, keeps repeating when you listen to testimonies who were of people who actually live in these camps now. People can only leave during restricted hours per day. They are surrounded by barbed wire fence and also patrolling police and in addition, they are filmed all day. So we are asking now in this event, um, what do these new type of camps mean for European migration policy? Which political strategy do they serve? And also, in the end, which strategy can be used against them? And uh, we will discuss this with uh, three speakers today, two of them here on stage and one due to uh, COVID in Frankfurt on the screen. Um, Daphne Toles will talk about the camp, which has already been opened at Samos. And Daphne is a freelance journalist and documentary filmmaker and recently released a documentary about the newly opened camp in Samos. Very happy to have you here. Happy to be here. Thank you. And uh, with Atina... Oh, sorry. Tavasili, sorry again for misspelling your name. You will give us insights on the new camp in COS and how it affects your work as a lawyer with the organization Equal Rights Beyond Borders. And uh, finally, on the screen, we cannot see him right now, uh, we will talk with Karl Kopp from ProAsyl, who will give us a pic bigger picture and explain how these new camps fit into general EU migration politics and especially the new pact on migration and asylum. We will discuss here on the podium for around 45 uh, minutes and then we will open the floor to your questions. And finally, who is we? We are Borderline Europe, an association fighting for the freedom of movement. We are based in Berlin, Sicily and on Lesbos. And we do everything from reporting on the borders of Europe, publication campaigns, protest actions and events like this. And in order to do so, we unfortunately need money. So <laughs> in this spot, thank you to Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and Citizens for Europe for funding this project. And maybe also thanks for your donation at the end. <laughs> um, we are very happy to have such a well-informed uh, podium and such well-informed speakers. But still, it is really a shame that we do not have the real experts on these camps on our podiums, which is the inhabitants themselves, the people on the moves who are affected by these policies we are talking about tonight. So before the event, uh, we were in contact with Samos Advocacy Coll Collective. This is like a self-organized collective who tries to get the perspectives of people in the camp on Samos out of the camp into the world. Um, they collected testimonies from inhabitants of the camp, which we will read out and use throughout the event at some parts. And they also provided us with some pictures 
um, they are from a student project by Lucy Dravel. And um, yeah, see, the interesting thing about this is that um, it's actually people inside the camp documenting their everyday life and like taking picture, pictures of their life in the camp and not always like us white Europeans coming into the camp and taking the pictures. Um, yeah, so this is, um, I will just put them through. It's like impressions from the Samos camp, the first one which was opened last um, autumn. Daphne, you were actually in this camp. You don't only know the pictures, but you've been there several times. I think last time in February, you told me. Mm -hmm. So when you first um, saw this new closed camp, which was built there, what was the thing which most like stroke you? Um, that was uh, in uh, September, end of September 2021, when um, they were starting to transfer people from the old camp in Samos from people who were living in tents and makeshift shelters, and uh, they, they were supposed to move them to this new facility. So that's where they took us on a trip, like uh, right before the opening and the inauguration, they took some journalists and showed them around, and then there were some questions, the migration minister was there. Uh, so as soon as you were just going into the bus and you arrive at this, structure which looked like huge as this is one of the pictures that uh, was in the documentary as well so you just saw many little white containers you know dots of containers and wire fence everywhere and then barbed wire uh, a big gate that wrote and right on top that this is the new like not the new it's a closed control access center in english and in greek uh, and of course, then the, in the you st you stepped inside, and there were um, police, police, policemen, and uh, security, uh, and these like type of security control for where we go to the airport and put our stuff through security, and turnstiles uh, and magnetic gates. So basically, it, it had this uh, dystopian feeling of something, you know, just metallic containers, barbed wire, NATO, NATO type fencing as they call it, and no trees at the moment, no green, although Samos is also a green island, but because they had to excavate and level the ground and build this huge facility for 3,000 people uh, and make it, make it uh, similar like an archetype and uh, the same camp has to be implemented in all five Greek islands, so at the beginning it, there was, it was completely dry and you couldn't see anything around, just some hills, some mountains, okay, some trees in the background, but it had this sense of, of a naked and very cold feeling of a, of a camp. Um, they had told us that they, would put, they were going to plant some trees, uh, okay, it will take some time until this happens. Uh, but of course, you know, it was it was just a dry and cold feeling. It was the new, so everything was brand new and shiny and clean. Um, but uh, but somehow, you know, soulless. Yeah, and like also these these X-ray things. When you enter, you can also see them in um, an excerpt of your documentary, which you brought with us. It's it's uh, in in Greek. I think you made it for. For Vice Greek, so we are going to show it like we c because you can also see a bit like the the, the procedure at mm -hmm. the beginning when people enter. Just very shortly, you say something in Greek, which yes. I obviously couldn't figure out. Like, what are you roughly saying? So I'm saying I'm standing on top of this hill. You can see some of the building, like the construction vehicles, are still in there because it was 
uh, update, you know, I mean it was still being built and some areas were not complete uh, by the opening, of course. Uh, so I'm saying that this is a new camp behind me, I'm showing behind me, that where's the capacities for 3,000 people. So any person arriving now on this island on Samos will be brought here and wait, they will have to wait here, register here, uh, apply for asylum. Uh, so that's where they will have to stay. Αυτό είναι το καινούριο κλειστό ελεγχόμενο κέντρο. Χωράει περίπου 3.000 ανθρώπου. Όσοι πρόσφυγε και μετανάστε διασχίζουν τη θάλασσα και φτάνουν στο νησί τη Σάμου, θα μεταφέρονται εδώ και θα παραμένουν μέχρι να εξεταστεί το αίτημα ασύλου του. The first two couple of days when they were moving from the old camp uh, on Samos to this new facility where you see the turnstile, the metallic, uh, the gates, the fingerprints and, and the x-rays, the x-ray machines going through their belongings for any sharp objects or any knives or something that is, should not go in the camp according to the authorities. Yeah, you were saying that uh, it was actually quite empty, like the whole camp. Um, I found one like testimony collected by the Samos Advocacy Collective, where one person living in the camp reported, during the whole day, we're just using our mobile phones, we're sleeping and we don't have any activities and it's so boring. So from your experience, what do people's days in these camps actually look like? Like, are there any activities in the camp? Well, now, for example, there um, I was last there in February and there was a, a courtyard where they could uh, play some volleyball and uh, some football. So people, it was actually winter and winter time and, and cold. And it was like a, a gathering area. So uh, people were playing between them volleyball sometimes with volunteers uh, from uh, NGOs or with people working in civil society organizations, they were also interacting and playing with them and walking around. Uh, there wasn't much of an activity. There was like a common tea area, a small area where they could go and have tea again from uh, civil society organizations and uh, a laundry area, laundry facility. Um, because also it's, you know, it's not so easy to go outside or in leave the camp and even if you do leave it's seven kilometers and you have to travel a bit of a distance to get there or, or take a bus um, and you need to have a card asylum applicant card active in order to be able to exit the camp and come back again by eight o'clock yeah that that was been like my question because like officially it's this weird thing of like controlled but closed but and officially open so in theory um 
like people can leave the camp between like 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. You already mentioned it briefly. I've read a lot that there's uh, like actually a lot of problems in practice for people to leave the camp. Like the one thing is the distance, but there's also like a problem with these buses, right? Yes, there is a problem with the with you know the frequency of the buses or when they pay ticket or when they don't, because if they have a medical uh, issue that is uh, confirmed, then maybe some uh, NGO can actually help them and bring a bus in or take them to the hospital if needed. Uh, but other times it's it's more complicated for them to leave and go and find the bus station, the bus stop, and take the bus and and even pay a ticket. Even you know, even if it's one twenty or two years, it's a lot with uh, the money that you get per month. Yeah, which only is like seventy five euros, euros per month. Only yeah. uh, whilst whilst your application is being processed and up until you actually uh, are approved, and only for a month later, that's it. And then you it's cut off. Every any financial assistance is cut off. If you're rejected, of course, then you don't get anything, any money because you're rejected. So it means that y you should, you know, leave Greece somehow. Yeah, that's I think what what we also saw in the video at the beginning that um, yeah, he was talking about it's like two hours walk from the city center. Whereas the old camp I think was something like ten minutes from the center. Yeah. Yes. Just. Uh, I, um, I wanted to go back to this thing you said, because it sounds quite nice, people are playing volleyball, but <laughs> maybe to give us an idea, like how long are the people actually in the in the camp? So now again, it depends because they're, they're supposed to have a fast track uh, asylum procedure now, which means that uh, compared to the previous years where they would ma wait for six, eight months, 10 months, 12 months, and or their next uh, appointment for uh, the asylum application was in two years' time. So now they, they, they are supposed to get it faster, you know, but most of the times this will be a rejection. Uh, or if it's not a rejection, it means that they can, uh, uh, sorry, if it is a rejection, then they have uh, one more time the uh, ability to apply for asylum like a uh, appeal uh, and then apply again, but they have to pay for that now. Uh, they, it's like a second application that you have to pay 100 euros to to do that. It, this is recent. I mean, it's changed recently. Uh, whereas before you didn't have you did you weren't you know you didn't have to pay. Now there's this extra cost, which is a lot of money. Imagine a family of four, for example, um, to pay to pay that amount just to. To apply again or to try and uh, you know appeal against that that decision, so I mean I, I talked to civil society organizations organizations there and people working in the camp and said they said well this volleyball this field actually this courtyard uh, is like an escape uh, for for the people the, you know they sort of do something to actually relieve themselves and have some fun and. And play, you know, have a, because there's not much else they can do. Either sit inside their container or go to the tea area, stand there and uh, do some laundry, do some cooking. But there's not much, uh, you know, many activities there. There's some informal, maybe education for some of the children uh, uh, provided, or some language courses. But mostly, it's like NGOs providing legal assistance or uh, medical care psychosocial support in in the camp uh, and you know they're trying to sort of build build on to that what kind of activities are going to happen because before that people could go out before I mean in the o o other camp they could go out in Samos and do some classes language classes or other kind of activities all around uh, Samos the Samos town yeah so like sounds good but obviously when you're stuck in this asylum process, you won't play volleyball for two years. Um, one thing, um, yeah, we, which you can also see in the picture, and which was mentioned, is w what makes it like this this prison kind of impression is the surveillance technology. So the Greek government received uh, 37 million euros from the EU Recovery Fund, this thing which was set up for uh, Corona. 
four parts of the surveillance te technology, which was used in the new closed camps, like in each of them. Uh, can you give us a little impression, like apart from this uh, NATO type of uh, barbed wire fence, what is used in these camps? Um, okay, so there's the entrance, as you see, you go through this search, this x-rays, uh, the x-ray machines, uh, fingerprint, so that you can actually enter. And, and then there's like, of course, there's Greek police and private security. It's 24 hours monitored, which according to, you know, the, the government and the authorities, this is for the security of the people living in the camp and also for the staff of the camp. This the, that's the, you know, the reason when I asked why do you need to have all the security is because um, people living here should should have security, but also staff has, should have security because previous times in Moria on Lesbos Island or uh, whenever there's overcrowded conditions, maybe, you know, there were stabbings and there were people like uh, having fights. So now we're doing this for the safety of the people living here and for the safety of, uh, of the staff. And, and there's, of course, CCTV cameras in key points everywhere around the camp. There's these big lights that you saw as well, uh, well, you saw them in the in the film, like big lights lighting the camp in a in a way that it looks like a um, I don't know. It reminds me of of you know the films that we see the prisons in in the United States. These kinds of lights and the CCTV cameras when they enter and control, you know, they pass through the security and they they pass like a security check. There's cameras seeing who goes in and who goes out. They actually can see that from a control center in Athens that uh, has access to all the CCTV cameras on Samos, Kos and Leros, so they can switch between them. And there's people monitoring and seeing what is happening in these camps and they will alert if something happens. So like we can maybe say that um, there was like, there was violence as a consequence of structural violence of these camps. And now this structural violence is actually still there in the form of these camps, but the attempt is now to like securitize it even more with this like very sophisticated technologies. Um, from what I've read, one of the, and like uh, maybe to, to, to just to add like all we read in these reports also by um, Samus Advocacy Collective is that people don't feel safe, they feel monitored. And um, I also read that one of the aspects um, which this technology aims for is actually preventing spontaneous gatherings and so to say political organization and resistance in the camp. Mm -hmm. So how does that work out? Like, is it effective? Do these, does this like surveillance and like screening them from methods actually work out the way the authorities intended to? Well, now this would be for Samos, that would be hard to say because when you know when I went there, both times there were 400 people, so that's not a lot. Now there's 500 people, which is again not a lot for a camp intended for 3,000 people. Um, but certainly, I mean, this is uh, as this camp is made also, which uh, we, I mean, it's not a secret. It was made to also deter people from coming to Greece. So not having that sense of freedom that they previously had, you know, you come in a camp, you are in there, you can go in and out uh, basically whenever you like. So this has to stop, that's what the government said. We have to ha have these new controlled access, which means we act control and we who accesses these camps, when they go in, when they go out, uh, and everything is monitored. So you will not be able to, to do like protests, um, or do some sort of any in, inside the riot or, you know, just basically you are being yeah, watched and monitored and there's 24 hour surveillance um, in order so, you know, so that you can't really, um, you know, misbehave uh, in a way, let's say, if if, if they were to misbehave, but um, when, when we go there or as journalists or sometimes when there's visits, people do, will try, you know, they will quickly write in a placard, in a paper, you know, something like, 
this is a prison we want to leave please give us asylum you know the, I was there in February and they very quickly reacted when they found out that there's a journalist and actually were three journalists there and they were waiting also for some high ranking official from uh, from I think it was maybe no it wasn't Germany but uh, some high ranking official um, to come from another and they and they found out about it and they quickly wrote these placards and tried to you know spread their message and communicate that we feel trapped here we feel prison in prison especially those that were rejected because they could not leave the premises because they're rejected which means that they have to wait until they are uh, deported back to Turkey in theory, but Turkey will not accept uh, any people back since 2020. I mean, there was this uh, EU uh, agreement signed in 2016 uh, between EU and Turkey, which uh, said that Turkey will take people back from Greece that are rejected, asylum seekers. But since March 2020, because of Corona, as Turkey announced, uh, they were not taking people back, and they still have. They're still not taking people back. So those who are rejected, they're basically stuck and in limbo. Yeah, we'll also come to that um, with like when we talk about costs. Like just a short question because the access for journalists is really restricted, right? Like you need an official. You are also accompanied, as far as I understood. Like when you um, enter. Yes, you are accompanied by someone working from the camp. Uh, or someone in a managerial position, uh, you yeah you won't roam free roaming freely inside the camp. You're, and you have of course a specific amount of time that you're allowed to stay in, which is normally up to one hour. So how did they just very quickly? How did they react when actually people were having these protest signs? Um, well, we we had to move forward basically for uh, you know the, we couldn't stick around there and. Uh, discuss to, to talk with people we have to move around so that we complete our visit and then we we st stood by it this f this uh, volleyball and football area and that's where we managed to talk a bit more with uh, with the people and some people of course they were not very uh, happy or oh my, they were happy to see us there but they were not feeling uh, like they could trust us or they couldn't uh, trust, not us exactly, but if they said something that would affect their asylum application, basically. So that's what I mean by trust. You know, they're saying, what if I speak to you and talk to you about anything, and then this will affect me, and if uh, affect me even if it's my first application or my second application. So they were a bit concerned of on on that. Yeah. So actually, it's really hard to get information out of the out of the camps. So. Spontaneous gatherings, political organisa organization within the camp are really hard. How is it like very quickly about um, other self-organized structures? Like we've seen that in, for example, in Moria, but also in Samos, that um, people in these like overcrowded hotspot camps actually organized things like barber shops or bakeries. How is this in the in the new camp? Is there like any space for this kind of self-organized structures anymore? No, not really. I mean, there, I didn't see that happening. I'm not sure if this is going to change in the future, but this is really discouraged from happening. Um, and and there's, because of course there's constant constant monitoring, constant surveillance. Um, that would be like, uh, I guess, from the side of the authorities, like enabling some sort of black kind of market, which they, they wouldn't do that. So maybe this will happen in, in, in secrecy. But this was also a sense of community. Of course, the conditions were bad in Moria and in previous camps, like really bad. Uh, but you know, people had to survive and people had to find some ways to be resourceful. And there were needs as well. And during COVID, there were even more needs in these camps because they weren't allowed to go out of the camps. So they had to somehow find a, a resourceful way to stay within the confinement of the area and also continue to buy groceries or have uh, laundry or even a print shop. The, there were many resourceful people in Moria that I remember. Uh, and this, no, no, not really. I'm not seeing it happening. Or even these bakeries that, uh, bakeries, these sort of 
uh, oven, made clay ovens that the Afghans make, and they make this bread, which is part of the tradition and the culture. Uh, I don't. I, I'm not seeing this happening anytime soon. Can be so, can be early to say. Might this might change, but for the moment, everything looks like it has to be sterilized and really in a way, you know, that orderly, you know, you have the cafeteria, you go to the cafeteria at this time, uh, you go to the laundry facility at this time, you go to the, I mean, you go to your container and that's it, basically. Uh, we already said it, it's kind of hard to get information about the camp. Um, when we had a pre-discussion on the event, I actually asked about the medical conditions because this is something which was criticized a lot or which was like horrible in the old hotspot camps. There was, yeah, like, inadequate is actually a weak adjective for you, describing the kind of medical care. Now in Samos and also in the other camps, there is medical staff on site. You also said there's also, like, psychological psychologists present there. And you said you, don't, you, you didn't actually, you couldn't double check um, what the situation is now. But still, we wanted to share with you that there are actually testimonies like this one from an inhabitant of the camp who's saying, if someone is really sick, he's going to die. Nothing will prevent him from dying. We said everything that was not going well, the baby is coughing, I have medical problems, and I asked to be referred to the hospital, they said not. It's, uh, yeah, it's hard, hard to tell what is actually happening, but there's also other t testimonies by um, also an interview which was done by like a BBC journalist um, with a woman from Somalia um, who was suffering um, from the consequences of genital mutilation and like she just wasn't sent to the hospital and like even though there seems to be medical staff on the side, there's still this problem of like arbitrary treatment and people just not being trusted, people not being sent to the hospital. Yes, and now there's a MSF, the, the Medecins Sans Frontières, that they have a mobile clinic and they go three times a week try to, trying to access, trying to also do hygiene promotion um, and for the women as well and, and women who are pregnant and women uh, um, who have given birth but uh, that's three times a week and they're still in waiting for the doctor you know, to, to, to come in the camp, the main doctor from the National Health public health authorities to actually start in, in the camp. So there is a shortage. There was always a shortage in all the camps. I mean, a lack uh, of av available doctors and medical facilities, but now it's even, you know, there's more, there's more uh, barriers in between, let's say, the asylum seeker and going to the hospital on their own and trying to access uh, health services and healthcare. Now there's this, these barriers because they can't leave easily. They can't leave the camp and go to the hospital. Thank you very much for giving these impressions about Samos. <laughs> we will move to uh, course now and to you, Atina. Um, as I already said, you're a lawyer with Equal Right Beyond Borders, and you were actually born on COS and you, yeah, grew up there and like recently moved back there again. Um, then I had a look at um, what this camp there looks like. I had the impression it looks quite, <laughs> quite similar. It's kind of same structures. We still um, decided in our pre-discussion to show like a little excerpt from a video, which is ex actually by the Greek um, Ministry for Migration and Asylum. Um, also to to give you like some uh, drone views of this uh, new camp, but also because it struck us like how these camps are presented um, you will you will see by the music what we mean <laughs> very good video <laughs> hi everyone thanks for having me
about these uh, sporting areas. <laughs> um, I find it uh, quite, yeah, quite striking, like this difference between what we hear from the people in the camp, like telling it's a prison, like putting out a protest sign as soon as somebody, as, as a journalist comes, and then this real, really weirdly, I don't know, <laughs> Star Wars kind of music with, uh, yeah, these pictures from the prison. Um, we already had the impressions, like from what is life kind of like in the in the camp on Samos. Um, Cause now is um, an interesting case because like the setup of the of this uh, camp is quite similar. It's quite similar in all of the the islands, but still there are differences um, regarding the political context. And Cause is especially interesting because already the Greek islands are something like a laboratory for EU migration politics, where like things are tried out, like these kind of new things. And then you said that before in our pre-discussion that COS is even more among these islands, like a labor laboratory for like testing out new restrictive deterrence poli politics um, policies. Um, you said, first of all, that COS is different than the other Greek islands because of the attention it gets compared to the other ones. What, what do you mean by this? Um, in order to understand the cost context, you have to understand, <laughs> yes, you have to understand that Kos is one of the biggest touristic destinations of Greece, which means that there's a high pressure from the local government and from the people in the big business of tourism to actually hide the refugee situation. So I think this has impacted a lot the policies uh, being tested on Kos and it had it has made the local authorities very creative in finding ways to actually hide and restrict the refugees and the asylum seekers on the island. Um, so they have, I think as we offer all-inclusive packages to tourists, we basically are offering all-inclusive detention packages to asylum seekers from arrival until deportation. Uh, we have detention in many different ways, um, all of them completely illegal, all of them automatic and with no individualized assessment. So this is why I mean cost is different and detention on cost is different and also you have to take into account the fact that COS is the only island out of the five Aegean islands with a pre-removal detention center after Moria Moria's uh, pre-removal detention center was burned down last year, which means that we are the only ones with an actual prison, like a labeled prison on the islands. So all of the detention policies are being tested there. Yeah, that's uh, what I'd like to talk to about more in detail. So these pre-removal detention centers, that is something which is um, foreseen in all of the new closed camps. Um, uh, as far as I understood, it's only operating so far in, in COS. Maybe first of all, what does this very technical term mean, pre-removal detention center? So yes, just a clarification before answering the question. Um, the new camp, the new facility is inaugurated, but it's not in use, meaning there were two different separate facilities before already existing, the so-called hotspot cause hotspot and next to it the pre-removal detention center and now the new facility is built around these two pre-existing uh, facilities. So pre-removal detention center means um, a place, a prison where rejected asylum seekers are being detained under uh, an EU regulation uh, in order to be removed from the country because they have no legal right to stay in the country anymore. And like to understand that actually um, since the beginning of January, almost everyone arriving on the island has been detained, right? So since January 2020 until September 2021, together with the uh, coming into force of the new asylum law of Greece, COS was the only island where people were automatically being detained upon arrival, meaning that everybody who arrived on the island was immediately put into this pre-removal um, facility, even though they were asylum seekers. The only people that were exempted were visibly pregnant women and recognized unaccompanied minors. 
And this has changed since, and like the detention policies have been developing, but yeah, this was a very cost-specific trend. So yeah, but like a very cost-specific trend, which yeah might serve kind of like as a pretext where it's it's uh, tried out. Um, so to give us, you said like people are basically put in in prison. So in order to imagine what this uh, pre-detention looks like. So, like, maybe to, to make clear again, so we already had this only on COS, this pre-detention, but now it's going to be installed, like, in all of these um, camp new camps, so there's always going to be, like, one specific um, section for this pre-detention. Pre um, Pre-removal detention center, sorry. Um, in order to give us a little bit of an impression what these sections are like, um, you sent me um, some testimonies which you gathered with your organization in a report where you actually interviewed people about the conditions in these centers and um, as both of us, we found them quite intense, we decided just to, to show them to you and like um, you can just read them by yourselves and then we will discuss them. <laughs> where is the... You can just leave it there. You actually send me a lot more testimonies. <laughs> um, I guess it's very hard actually to uh, um, yeah put all of this together, but like just to give us an, an overview from your perspective as a lawyer, so which rights would you say are, are violated in these um, sections? Yeah, uh, so you are all aware of the bad living conditions in Greece, of the flawed asylum procedure, so you have to imagine that detention makes everything worse about all of these situations. Every possible right, substantive or procedural that you can think about is being violated because people are detained. Uh, the long-term and short-term psychological consequences of being detained are immense and like nobody gets out of it unaffected. The people in detention, the professionals working with the detainees, and it is generally a context where violations flourish. Nothing is being implemented as it should. There are many regulations in place, many laws in place that protect, that are supposed to protect the um, the rights of the detained and they are, they are all being disregarded by the authorities. So we are talking about access to the asylum procedure being more difficult, access to medical care. There was in this pre-removal detention center, there used to be a doctor. He is called Dr. Dipon by the, um, by the detainees. Dipon is uh, the Greek pill for paracetamol, so everybody who had an issue was going to the doctor and he was just giving uh, paracetamol to all of them, which resulted to a death of a person in March 2021 by an infected appendix. It was never treated, he was complaining for five days and then he died in his cell in the most horrible situation and nothing happened so far. 
Um, we are talking about um, bad living conditions in general, unhygienic conditions, uh, not proper food, not enough water, obviously not recreational activities like what you uh, described for Samo sounds very fancy for what is happening uh, on course. Uh, so every little aspect of the everyday life is being completely twisted in the detention center and this impact is very, very um, hard on the detainees and on their condition. So they are growing desperate and they feel like their, their lives will end there. And this practice of detention is now actually continued in the framework of these new camps. So do you already know how we can imagine these um, pre-removal detention sections in the, in the new camps? Is it going to be like you described it for costs or are there any hints already? I think it won't be only the, those detention sections within the new facilities. I think that we can like from our observations from COS and like from the legal research that we are making on the issue, we cannot say like that these new uh, closed facilities are de facto illegal, for example, are a priori illegal, but they will eventually amount to widespread and automatic detention. So it, it won't only be these sections, it will be the whole camp as a concept, detention. That is the problem. So. Yeah, so you would you would say like already this is I think what I understood as the lab laboratory thing, right? Like we, it's actually not really a legal thing, but then you know through the practices it just increases like until we have everybody detained. That's what you're seeing. Mm, now maybe concerning your work, we've already heard that uh, journalists have a hard time accessing these new camps. Um, it's also actually the same for lawyers and also um, human rights uh, defenders. They also can only enter like with permission and also with somebody from the Greek authorities like with them. Uh, you are a lawyer. You are usually counseling people on the move. Um, how is your work now affected by these new camps? Like how can you actually enter them? Mm. Uh, we were not allowed to enter this um overarching facility for like the first nine months of the operation of the office on cause because you have to remember that there's an increasingly restrictive um, legislation in place in Greece so NGOs need to register with an NGO registry um, very closely regulated by the, minister, by the Ministry of Migration and with a wide discretion on who gets this registration status and who doesn't, so we are not registered yet with, uh, with this NGO registry, not because we didn't apply, but because we were uh, rejected for manifestly unlawful reasons. So because of this, uh, we were entirely blocked from accessing uh, the camp and our clients, uh, even though lawyers should have a privileged position and they have more rights th by the legislation itself. And... Um, we have overcome this period of our operation. We have some kind of access now, but it is still very tightly regulated. We also have people following us around. And this is only the practical aspect of it, but there's also the psychological aspect of it because we face extreme intimidation. We face extreme harassment. We, uh, like the fear, you can feel it and you can sense it. And also remember that COS has a very limited number of NGOs. Actually, we are the only ones working outside of the camp. There are two legal NGOs providing legal aid in the camp, uh, which are registered with uh, their NGO registry. So it is very easy for them to provide legal aid, not easy for us. And then there's nobody else. So. Um, the authorities feel like they can block us and restrict our access because we are the only ones on the island with this technical issue, but also fighting from outside. And that's also a little bit uh, specific for COS, right? That there's like so little um, presence of international NGOs also and also very little media attention. 
Um, so, but then this means if you are not allowed to enter, then the people don't have any legal counseling? So the, this, ultimately, if you put everything down, it means that they can only have access to the four lawyers that are currently working in the camp because the procedures are so fast and because I talked about different kinds of detention and one type of detention is after you get registered and your asylum application starts being examined, you are also restricted within this facility and we have no right to access it for 25 we have no right to access it anyways, but they are not allowed to leave for 25 days, and within this 25 days period, the whole of asylum pr procedure is being completed. This means that they cannot actually seek for our um, legal representation, and if the four lawyers who are operating in the camp, who are obviously not enough, and there's a capacity issue, um, regarding how many you can represent and how well you can represent them, it means that they are effectively being blocked from accessing their right to legal aid. And like, if you if you can summarize that shortly, which other rights, like in general, would you see violated in in these camps? Every right. <laughs> As I talked about detention, like every aspect and every right that is provided for by the regulations and by the legislation is being violated one way or the other, either directly or indirectly. Okay, we, <laughs> we um, thank you very much for this also legal yeah legal view and also the view on on costs where we say it's le the laboratory and maybe what we will see on all of the islands um we will move to uh Karl now Karl Kopp, and try to to make a bit more sense out of what we've heard so a bit like the the political perspectives of which purposes do these uh, camps actually serve do uh, okay. <laughs> we will see him in a in a minute. <laughs> yeah, maybe in the meantime, I was wondering, like, but why is there actually so little, like, international people also on COS? I don't know if it is intentional or not, but I think that there was an active campaign by the COS authorities not to disrupt the public image of course as a top touristic destination where people can come and chill and lay on the beach and I think uh, having like this notorious publicity like Samos and Lesbos would hurt immensely the financial um, aspect of the operation on the island. I think um, this is the reason. I'm not sure, but this is how I'm reading the situation. And that was right from the beginning, in 2015, very beginning of everything. I remember in 2015, end of August, um, there was a front page on, I think it was The Sun or some uh, British tabloid, and there were, in, in the foreground, you could see like a family of four British people that were, you know, with their sunglasses looking very unhappy, and in the background there was a big, you know, long queue of people, asylum seekers, uh, trying to register in the, in, the, in, the, in the authorities, basically. So th that was the front page, and like, you could see like they were very... Uh, th this image I remember, because it made... Recording in progress. Uh, it made, the, you know, it made an the impact island, negatively, think, uh, in a way, because it was a bit not. discriminatory. So that was sure, early 2015 on course. I mean, summer of 2000, early in the migration and refugee crisis. Yeah, but that's, uh, I think that's also interesting for us as the, the audience to realize that actually the less attention there is, exactly. like, the exactly. more it gets into, uh, yeah, these practices. Okay, Kai Kopp is there having a smoke and prepared. Can you hear us? Kai, can you hear us? In the, in the authorities, basically. So the, that was the front. Kai, can you hear us? Wunderbar. Okay. 
Hello, Carl. Maybe you can say hello as well so we can see whether it works. Yeah, it's not going it's over my laptop, I think. <laughs> very, very sorry. This was very spontaneous because um, almost everyone in the office of Proasyl is uh, sick with co Corona and Karl is staying in the office. Okay. Can uh, you say hello again so we can see whether it works? <laughs> yes. I switch off uh, YouTube uh, and say hello again. Yes, thank you. Okay, <laughs> hello, Carl. Um, so. <laughs> okay, so Carl, we've had this very vivid impression now. You can say hello as well, so we can see whether it works. Oh, hello again. <laughs> can you hear it's me? Going there. <laughs> yes, but we can also hear ourselves, that's the problem. Do you still have your YouTube uh, Very, on? very sorry. This was very spontaneous because um, I almost... Mona and Carl staying in the office. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, can you, can you hear me? Again, so we can see that it works. Can you hear me? Off, uh, YouTube uh, and say hello again. Yes. Thank you. Okay, hello, Khan. I think you should turn off one, either YouTube or something. Or, uh, or there's two Zooms, maybe. Maybe, maybe in the meantime... Yeah, probably because of the YouTube. Maybe in the meantime, we we will move to like um, what we can do and like strategies in the end. But like a, a short question, I was actually wondering, would your advice then be because you said like cause is like the main or one of the main tourist attractions. So would you say like not to go on holidays there? Yes, <laughs> you, you can give us some numbers of uh, like people yes. visiting so that we Yes, so uh, I got some numbers and the numbers are like one international flight, no? One international flight per uh, five minutes uh, lands uh, at Coast Airport every day. We are expected to have one, one million point five tourists throughout this summer season. It is supposed to be the best season ever for Coast. Like if you get to the island, you can actually feel how crowded it is. And I think nobody visiting Greek, uh, Kos is aware that somewhere in a remote location, it, there is like this gigantic prison that we saw uh, where people are being detained, where rights are being violated, and where they are generally being treated that something le less than a human. So yes, boycott Kos, even though they, I will have a difficult time uh, as a Kos resident, but uh, yes or bring attention to it at least. Best season ever for course. Like 